So what lab tests should every patient have done? I get this question a lot, and I just wanted to take a few minutes and run through some very standard labs that most patients will have done, and then what I do in my practice that's a little bit above and beyond that I find really helpful for patients to move the needle. Hi, I'm Dr. Lily Johnston, vascular surgeon trying to put herself out of business and metabolic health specialist, which is what I am using to try to do that. I get this question a lot, and I just wanted to take a few minutes and run through some very standard labs that most patients will have done, and then what I do in my practice that's a little bit above and beyond that I find really helpful for patients to move the needle. We are working on cardiovascular risk reduction and prevention, so you never need my services as a surgeon. So let's dive in and talk about some lab testing. There are things that you will have done as part of your regular annual panel with your primary care. By the way, call to action, if you have not seen your primary care doctor in a hot minute, like a couple of years, now would be a great time to make that appointment so that you can get some of these standard tests done and maybe even ask for the advanced ones that if you stick around till the end, we'll cover. All right, so in your annual lab panel, you'll get a complete blood count, a basic metabolic panel, and probably a lipid panel. And that last one does get people a little bit spun up and we'll talk about that We'll do a whole dedicated episode to that at another time, but let's just cover briefly today what is in those three main tests. Your complete blood count looks at the cells in your blood, right? White cells that fight infection, red blood cells that carry oxygen, and the little sticky platelets that help our blood clot if we cut ourselves or have an injury. The white blood cell count is all about infection and also how the bone marrow is doing. We're not going to worry too much about that today. Red blood cells carry oxygen, which is a big deal if you're the heart or the brain or the leg muscles that need that oxygen to function optimally. So we want to make sure that your red blood cell counts are adequate to carry the oxygen that you will need for your muscles to work, your brain to work, and your heart to keep pumping. But we also want it to be not too high because that might signal a problem. And if you watched my short last week, we talked all about how high red blood cell counts can sometimes be a clue that patients could have undiagnosed sleep apnea. So we look to see if you're anemic, meaning don't have enough red blood cells, or if they're too high. Those are both issues that can crop up. Finally, we look at the platelet count. Platelets are fun. They help blood clot. And often in my patients who have vascular problems, we will inhibit those platelets or try to stop them from being quite so sticky with things like aspirin or other medications like Plavix. The platelet count doesn't tell us how well those drugs are working, but platelets also go up when our body is inflamed. So that is an injury or a condition where the body is trying to mount an immune response that body believes that there could be like an injury. And so platelets will go up when the body's inflamed. So if platelet counts are too high, we do see that that's a marker for inflammation. So that's always something I pay attention to as well. All right, let's move on to your metabolic panel. This tells us a little about your metabolism that as we'll talk about in a bit, it is not as helpful as some of the other tests that I order, but it covers all the electrolytes or the salts in your blood, like sodium, potassium, chloride, carbon dioxide. Almost always, these will be in the normal range if your kidneys are working because your body always wants what's floating around in the serum to be normal. So it doesn't mean that because your calcium level is normal on your metabolic panel that you couldn't have osteoporosis and be deficient in calcium in your bones. That's a critical thing that a lot of my patients don't get is, well, the magnesium level in my blood was fine. I don't need to take magnesium supplementation. Well, you may not need it, but you certainly could have an issue there that you are unaware of. So just be cognizant of the fact that your body will prioritize keeping those levels in the blood normal above all else. And you could still have an issue someplace elsewhere in your body. All right, let's keep going. Basic metabolic panel also tells us about your kidney function. So this is your BUN or your blood urea nitrogen and your creatinine. Is your kidney filtering out all the toxins that it's supposed to? And that's a great metric, but an even better one 
that I like and order for many of my patients is something called the microalbumin to creatinine ratio. This is not a blood test. It's actually a urine test and it measures how much protein is spilling into the urine because the job of your kidneys is not only to filter out all the toxins, but to keep all the good stuff that are, we are supposed to keep like protein. And so if your body is spilling protein into the urine, that's a sign that your kidney may have been damaged by either high blood pressure or insulin resistance. And we need to focus on maintaining excellent kidney health. So if you have never had your microalbumin to creatinine ratio checked, and you think you might have damage from high blood pressure or insulin resistance and diabetes, it's a great thing to ask your doctor about and see if you can get that test done. All right. Finally, the lipid panel. Now people lose a lot of sleep about this. I see posts on Reddit about it all the time. Let's just go over what's in it, what it tells us and what it doesn't. And then we'll do a whole episode dedicated to this at another time. Stay tuned for that one. So what you'll get in your lipid panel is total cholesterol, your triglycerides, your HDL cholesterol, and your LDL cholesterol. And then you'll get some ratios and you'll get a number called non-HDL cholesterol, which is exactly what it sounds like, your total cholesterol minus the HDL. And you know the things that this tells me the most about is really actually your metabolism because your triglycerides and your HDL are vastly more impacted by what you eat. And it's more about the sugar than the fat, spoiler, than anything else. And your triglycerides, if we're eating too much sugar, or the body doesn't metabolize that sugar appropriately, your triglycerides will be high and your HDL cholesterol will be low. And in fact, those are two out of the five criteria for metabolic syndrome, which is insulin resistance. That is the definition of early insulin resistance is metabolic syndrome. High triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol are fundamentally a part of that. We also see the LDL cholesterol. And this gets so much hate uh, in, in the internet sphere and even in medical communities, but it's just a number. And the cholesterol that's carried by the LDL particles is the same as the cholesterol that's carried by the HDL particles. And it's really the particles that we're gonna worry about. We'll get into all of this in depth in another video. If you wanna see that video, please comment below. Let me know that this is an area of interest for you and subscribe to the channel so you'll be notified when that video comes out. But that LDL cholesterol is sometimes relevant in the grand scheme of when patients have plaque in their arteries or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So people at risk for heart attack, stroke, problems with circulation in the legs, right? That's sort of my bread and butter on the surgery side. And in those patients, LDL cholesterol is one among many, many things that we will look at to see where we can reduce risk. All right, let's talk about some of the other labs that I often order for patients that are a little outside of the normal. I think the two that I want everybody to focus on, and if you are waiting for your annual visit, I want you to ask your doctor to see if they'll test these for you. The first is fasting insulin. So we know diabetes is when blood sugars get out of control and they're too high, but even before the sugars go up, the pancreas produces this hormone called insulin. And when insulin is high, it tries to keep those sugars in check. And when we see an elevated fasting insulin, that tells us that we are detecting early insulin resistance, which means we have an opportunity to nip this problem in the bud before it ever causes you to become diabetic or to develop the complications of diabetes like kidney failure and ulcers and wounds on your feet and neuropathy, things like that. So the earlier we find this insulin resistance, the easier it is to manage with nutritional strategies and lifestyle changes, the faster we can get back to optimal metabolic health. So I want everybody to check your fasting insulin. Optimally, that number is six or less. When it's greater than 10, I'm pretty certain that we're working with an insulin resistance problem, okay? The next number I think everybody should know, and it really only needs to be checked once or twice in your lifetime, is something called LP little a, lipoprotein little a. This is a subset of LDL cholesterol. We already talked about the lipid panel, but LP little a does not come 
in a standard lipid panel? Why not? Great question. I wish I had an answer. Someday it probably will, but until then you need to ask for it. And it's important because it independently predicts your risk of not only cardiovascular disease, but also valvular disease like aortic stenosis when your aortic valve gets too narrow. And LP little a is by and large genetically determined and 20% or one in five people are walking around with elevated LP little a levels and they don't know it. So this is a huge risk factor. And even though we do not yet have pharmaceuticals or drugs directly targeting LP little a, there's a lot we can do to help you reduce your risk from LP little a. So get that checked. If it's normal, you never have to get it checked again. If it's elevated, it's likely always going to be in that elevated range. We know you have increased risk. We can proceed accordingly. And again, we don't really have to check it again. So it's once or twice in a lifetime, get it checked, know your number, know your risk. All right, let's end with a few other tests that I find really helpful in helping manage risk in my patients. The next is inflammation. So high sensitivity C-reactive protein or HSCRP is a non-specific marker of inflammation in the body. And we know from lots of scientific studies that elevated HSCRP is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and events, right? And when we talk about, well, well cholesterol is not relevant, LDL doesn't predict events, people always say it's not the lipids, it's the inflammation that starts this process of plaque formation. And largely, I agree with that. You know, we know patients who have things like rheumatoid arthritis, HIV, pro-inflammatory conditions have dramatically increased rates of cardiovascular disease. So we have to get this marker of inflammation under control. We have to know what it is because there are people who have normal levels of inflammation who will never be bothered by their elevated cholesterol levels. But if you have elevated inflammation and normal cholesterol levels, you could still be forming plaque. HSCRP can be elevated in the absence of any of those conditions like arthritis or lupus, things like visceral adiposity, visceral fat, fat that accumulates around our organs will drive up HSCRP. Dental infections, periodontal disease will drive up HSCRP. There are all kinds of other root causes we could look for, but if you have elevated inflammatory markers, it is a sign that you could have plaque forming and we need to figure out what's going on and work on that. I also check something called homocysteine. Homocysteine is a marker of your B vitamin metabolism and it's a middle byproduct. So if homocysteine is really high, our bodies are not doing a good job of converting inactivated forms of the B vitamins, which is typically what we eat and we get in our diet, to the activated forms. And if that's you, you might have a mutation in your genes like the MTHFR gene, which is very popular. There are maybe 10 different methylation genes that are uh, responsible for the enzymes that convert the inactive B vitamins to the active ones. So if you have high homocysteine, you have an elevated risk of heart attack and stroke, and we can give you the activated B vitamins, and that problem kind of goes away. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. So I check homocysteine in all of my patients, and if they need methylated Bs, I put them on that, and often we'll see homocysteine come right back down into that optimal range. Vitamin D is another vitamin marker that I check in many, many patients, because even in Southern California, where the sun's out often, many patients are still deficient either because they're just not getting enough time in the sun or they're wearing sunscreen or what have you. I don't know why, but we often find that we have to supplement people with vitamin D and K2 to get their levels in that optimal range. Lastly, uric acid. This is another metabolic byproduct and people know it for forming the crystals that cause gout, right? That painful, uh, often the toe <laughs> is where people get gout. And these crystals form and they deposit in the joint. And you know, you can imagine it's sort of just like sticking a wedge into the hinges of a door, right? Those crystals get in the way of that smooth fluid joint movement and gum up the works. And then the joint becomes miserably hot and inflamed and painful. Well, 
those crystals don't just form in the joint space. They deposit everywhere. They deposit in the wall of your blood vessels. They deposit in the kidneys. They deposit in the brain even. So that may, they may not cross the blood brain barrier. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it does impact brain health, heart health, blood pressure, and all types of things. So making sure that uric acid is under good control is another really valuable biomarker that I use in my practice to help my patients optimize their metabolic health. There are some other things that we didn't talk about, like thyroid hormone, sex hormones, cortisol. There are a bunch of other things that sometimes we get into the weeds with. I wanna hear from you. What other tests do you think every patient should have? What have you had done that really revolutionized your understanding of your own health? And we can talk more about some of those at another time. For now, I will see you guys next time. Thanks, Dr. Lily out. We will talk soon.